thank you very much, Tony, for your very warm welcome. And thank you to all of you at the Kavli Institute for inviting me and for being so gracious. Uh, I'd like to talk with you today about um, a topic which tries to look back into the beginnings of, of physics and where it came from. As Tony said, it, it has to do with this book that I've just published with MIT Press and the Apple iBooks. Um, and it may seem a strange or an odd idea. How exactly could music be associated with or important to the beginning of science? I'm going to try to persuade you that as strange uh, and odd a claim as this might be, it has some basis. And I want to present it to you in a kind of careful and modulated way. Um, we tend to take for granted, I suppose people here at the Kavli Institute assume the existence of physics as something that's given and granted, but it has a history. And the history is an important aspect of what physics is, of its limitations, of its past, and its future. Maybe I can begin with a quote from Albert Einstein in a very little known letter that he wrote to the African-American physicist Robert Thornton. He says, a knowledge of the historic and philosophic background gives the kind of independence from prejudices of his generation from which most scientists are suffering. This independence created by philosophical thought is, in my opinion, the mark of distinction between a mere artisan or specialist and a real seeker after truth. So I guess with these words of Einstein, I'd like to encourage us all as physicists to take very seriously history and philosophy of our science as being not merely um, side enterprises or even distractions, but part of what is the central activity of physicists as thinkers. Um, Einstein himself, even though he wasn't very good about footnoting his papers, was always looking back to the past and thinking about where ideas came from. Today, I attended a talk by Andrew Strominger in which he looks back 50 years to three different discoveries in different fields of physics and brought them together, showing a kind of historical awareness. Now, to, to, the, to proceed to try to look back into the earliest backgrounds of physics, wh where did it really come from? And the, the story I'm going to tell really goes back to ancient Greece, because it was there, of course, that the word physics was invented, that the science physics was coined and first described by Aristotle. But it didn't come about in isolation. Music and other uh, fields of thought were essential to the formation of it. And essentially, the, the story I'm going to tell goes back to the legends of Pythagoras, um, who experimented with strings, with glasses, with pipes, with hammers and anvils, and made the first connection between numbers and the physical world. Because they were not obviously c connected to people. The, the obvious connection happened in astronomy, looking at the movements of the planets. It seems clear that it's, it's far clearer that there are cycles that are numbers that can be associated with numbers of days, different events that could be timed and given some kind of uh, numerical measure. It's not clear that that's true in the physical world. Aristotle, in fact, denied even the founder of the physics, the first pers person to write a book on physics, felt that physics wasn't and couldn't be mathematical. Why did he say such an extraordinary thing? It's because for him, the world was divided into the realm of Uranus, which is the realm of the heavens, and the realm of physics, or growth and change, the realm of the things that we see around us, mainly biological things. It seems clear that in the realm of the heavens, there are regularities. But on Earth, it's not so clear. It's not clear how to go up to a tree and apply numbers to what's going on for the tree. The first place that this could be done was through music. So, and the first discoveries that were made were showing that certain simple uh, musical intervals have are correlated to simple ratios. So that, for instance, the octave, if you take two strings in the ratio of two to one, you hear an octave. And if you, other simple whole number ratios, three to two, four to three, you get other simple intervals, the fourth and the fifth, for instance. The fourth. And the interval between them is a whole tone. So these were very striking. Uh, discoveries. Why is it that when we hear two strings in the ratio of two to one, it makes us feel as if we're hearing something familiar as opposed to wincing? Whereas if we take an interval which is very close to the square root of two, 
sounds much more dissonant. So that already was very striking. Something about simple rational whole number intervals seems to, or at least to our awareness, to sound very different. And there are kind of fundamental mathematical problems, too. If you try to take this interval of a tone and to fill it up with an octave, you overshoot. You hear that tiny little deviation. It's called the Pythagorean comma. It means that there's a fundamental incompatibility in these simple whole number ratios, that you can't fill up the octave with tones. And from that uh, unfolds a whole uh, millennia long search for different kinds of tunings, which are going to, is going to return to, our, return to our story. So at any rate, under Pythagorean influence, Plato above all, put forward a series of four sister sciences or arts, which, he, which later became called the quadrivium, the fourfold way, which became the basis of all higher education to the present day. Up until then, what, a higher, what education was, you memorized Homer, and you learned to do a few simple sums. That was it for a, for a highly educated person. Plato said, no, you have to know mathematics. And not only do you have to know arithmetic and geometry, which he distinguished, one having to do with uh, integers, the others having to do with ratios that could be incommensurable. Um, but he also included astronomy and music. And the fact that this, these four liberal arts, the quadrivium, became and remained the basis of the education of all of the people that we're going to talk about today, with the possible exception of Max Planck, I think is crucial. If you want a kind of metaphor, it seems to me that these four, uh, four sister arts were the mothers of modern science. And out of their union in various ways came our, their, the children. And as most children are, the children are not necessarily very respectful towards the parents. But the, the parental rel relation remains even to this day. And since we're speaking about immortal beings, not humans like ourselves, their family dynamics continues forever. I'm going to try to talk to you today about three f uh, famous figures that are known to every physicist that represent, I think, important steps in the story that I would like to tell. Um, the first one of them, Johannes Kepler, of course, is very well known, and his relation to music, I guess, is the most famous of the three. Almost every physicist has heard of the fact that um, Kepler used, that in his Harmonisches Mundi, a book about the harmonies of the world, he the, used his, the new observations of Tycho Brahe to try to take the ancient ideas that the, that the heavens are not only moving in ratios of certain, certain ratios with more or less complex structure, but that those ratios had a musical correlate. What the musical correlate meant was that there was some kind of harmony or intelligible mathematical structure to what was going on in the heavens. Um, similar to the intelligible structure of ratios that could be found in vibrating bodies, such as Pythagoras was first trying to understand. It's in this, I submit, that the beginnings, especially of mathematical and theoretical physics, really rested. The attempt to bring together what seemed at first glance and for a long time seemed utterly incompatible, that is the realm of mathematics and then the realm of sensuous phenomena, to bring them together was first accomplished through the in music and through the intermediacy of music. And then that became the the pattern, the archetype, for the application of mathematics to many other aspects of the visible world. So Kepler, in this book, had already, by, this, by the time it's written, 1609, had already discovered what are now called the first two laws, having to do with the elliptical orbits of the planets and the, the area sweeping law, which he didn't call laws. But in this third book, he discovered the third and most surprising of his laws. Kepler grew up in a kind of musical world in which not only did he study the four liberal arts in the way that we'd been uh, talking about, that, that, so that he would study music and astronomy along with the others, but he was also active in practical music. Uh, singing was a normal part of the curriculum. Um, he refers, as I'll talk about, to various musical works in the course of his work. So in the he, he understands that he's taking up an ancient 
kind of idea that he's going to search for the harmony of the spheres, but he wants to take it in a new direction. How does he do this? First of all, because he's aware that the planets are not traveling in circles, their songs can't be just a single note. Their notes, he hypothesized, would span a certain interval. So you'll see that for the different, for the different planets, the song um, is faster or slower, higher or lower, in precisely reflecting the orbits of the planets as he uh, inferred them from Tycho Brahe's data. And so, and he includes the moon in this picture. But if we now go and we try now to put together, uh, to hear what it's like, it, it sounds something like this. Okay, wait a second. There we go. First Mercury, closest to the sun, most elliptical orbit, so it has a kind of widely varying melody. Then Venus, pretty nearly elliptical, just goes around in a quarter tone. Then the Earth, just a half step of motion. I'll talk about in a moment. a little bit more eccentric, so the melody moves up down a little bit, but it's lower in pitch because the distance is further, it's rather, the, the speed of evolution is so. Then moving outwards into planets, we come to Jupiter. Very far, very growly sounding, barely within the realm of human being. Saturn, even growlier, and further down in the base. But here's how it sounds. And the fact that it sounds, that it has this kind of sound, dissonant and utterly unlike the music that he knew, struck Kepler. And Kepler lived in a time was much like our own, a great deal of war and, and human suffering. In fact, he took the song of the Earth. The fact that the Earth has a song, that it's not at the center of the universe, but it has a pitch, interested him very much. And that the Earth song is me, fa, me, in his note names. Kepler transcribes this as miseria et famina, misery and famine. So Kepler understood he solved not only a great problem of physics, but an even more problem, but greater problem of moral philosophy. That is, why is there evil in the world? Well, you just heard, ladies and gentlemen, why there's evil in the world. It's because the cosmic music is awfully dissonant and messed up. And it's dissonant and messed up not because some composer decided to do it, but because in stacking the planetary orbits in this way, you get a highly dissonant mass of sound. And this rather shocked Kepler. Um, and he realized that it was very different from the music that he knew. For instance, here's a composition by Orlando de Lassus that he talks about a great deal in the course of this book on the harmony of the world, in May Transierend, a kind of penitential motet that sounds like this. That's a piece of music, and so Kepler himself is so struck by the contrast between this, and there's, there's Kepler's quotation. He, he knows the piece so well that he quotes it from memory. He misquotes it. It's a slightly inaccurate uh, quotation, but it shows how, how interested he is in this piece of music. One doesn't think of a great, uh, great physicist, a great astronomer like uh, Kepler being so aware of musical details, but he is. And he quotes this, and in fact, he's interested in it because in the spelling of his time, the beginning of this piece would have been spelled me, fa, me. And so it exactly is the song of the earth. And it's a, a piece that has to do with the wrath of God sweeping over the earth and begging for forgiveness. Words which made a lot of sense to Kepler, who, although he was Protestant, was expelled both from Catholic and Protestant lands, and whose mother was famously prosecuted for witchcraft. So he understood something about miseria et famina.
Um, and so this penitential motet it gives a kind of version of the Song of the Earth. And in one of the marginal notes to his book, Kepler says, would, it be, would I be going too far if I asked some ingenious composer to write a motet, basically to rewrite the cosmic motet and do it right, or do it in such a way that it sounded all right to human ears? The fact was, though, he was a scrupulous enough uh, physicist that he understood that he had to follow the data and he had to understand why God, who certainly could have written a much better piece than, than, than Orlando de Lassus, had co chosen to write this discordant cosmos that we hear and see all around us. Um, it was very disturbing to Kepler because one thing he realized, he calculated that presumably at the origin of the world, God would have started with a nice consonant chord, right? And he would have begun the motet from there and eventually the motet would go on for I don't know how many billions of years and it would reach another consonant chord and God would say, that's it. We'll have the last judgment right there. That's the appropriate musical physical time for it. But Kepler calculated that that moment could never occur. It's kind of a version of the ergodic theorem. Once you start those planets going with all of their dissonances, they're never going to reach a point where they're in agreement. Therefore, there can be no end to time, which of course is heretical. And you know, having been kicked out of several countries already, Kepler keeps rather quiet. But he sort of notices that, but doesn't, doesn't draw the very obvious con uh, consequence. One other thing which is interesting to note is that the, according to Kepler, the chief problem with the universe, which as you heard is very dissonant, is a kind of marital problem. The Earth and Venus are particularly dissonant with respect to each other because, because, they, because of the intervals that they form. And one of the reasons why the universe is in such a bad shape is not just because of dissonance in general, but because of the strife between men and women, or husband and wife in particular, which is Motet showed. Now, all this would be I, a, a sort of a, a mere curiosity for us, except that in the course of this very long and complicated book, uh, almost by, by the way, at a certain point, Kepler says, oh, no, by the way, as a result of this, I've found the following relationship. And he gives us the third law. That is to say, the relationship between the periods and the, the, the semi, you know, the semi diameter of the planet's orbits, according to the cube and the square. How did he find this law? It's perfectly clear that he'd been looking for things in the ratio of three to two, the interval of the fifth that he knew about since his studies of Pythagorean musical theory. He had been pawing through Brahe's data and only somebody that was looking for things like that would ever have noticed such an odd piece of information. And that odd piece of information, which he doesn't make much of, he doesn't call it a law. It was much later, probably in the 19th century, when people gave it that name. But certainly by the, Isaac Newton certainly really noticed it. And for Newton, of course, that was a crucial piece of evidence that enabled him to deduce the inverse square law of gravitation. So this musical finding of Kepler's had a lot of significance for Newton. Now Newton, in distinction to uh, Kepler, was not a very musical person. He was recorded to have attended only one opera in his life and he walked out during that opera, presumably out of boredom, or perhaps he had better things to think about. But we do know his, we have his manuscripts from his student days, so this is a, one of his manuscripts on music, which I uh, transcribed and published at a certain point. And it's a good example of Newton's work, his, his notebooks, which are obsessive to the last degree. So Newton, having heard from his teachers of the various you know, ratios that I told you about, the ancient musical theory, it, in, in his day, um, Cambridge was still a kind of backwater in which people were still doing the medieval liberal arts, which already on the continent were beginning to fade. But Newton got very interested in it and wrote, I mean, there are pages and pages and pages of, of like this in which he's taking the distances. These are notes, uh, not, not geometrical points, although he's trying out at the top of the page, you can see he's messing around with trying to do some kind of geometrical version. And at the bottom, you can see that he's making calculations to many significant figures of of ratios of things that are going on. So we know that this was important to him as a, as a, as a student. Um, and it has, and it, I guess you could say 
in his later life after he had retired and, and become, if that's the word, master of the mint and a wealthy and famous man, he liked to say that Pythagoras's liar uh, was the inverse square law of gravitation. He liked to draw comparisons between the inverse square law and in music. But the place where it most comes home in his work is in a very celebrated moment in the optics. Of course, one of his great discoveries besides the inverse square law. When Newton breaks, broke down this a spectrum of, of white light, he does so in such a way that he decided that it had to span a musical octave. And if it spans a musical octave, it should have just the same notes as an octave. Therefore, there should be, and you can see on the right-hand side of the picture, uh, of his picture, note names according to the old system of solfege that in which he would sp uh, spread it out. And to, to make this work, he had to introduce two colors, orange and indigo, which people have a lot of trouble seeing in the solar spectrum that you see. Do you see orange as opposed to red, yellow? And do you see an indigo as opposed to blue and violet? Well, not, not really. And that same problem happens here that, that, for instance, here we have a prism, which is very obediently showing all seven colors of the spectrum. But it does seem like it's been doctored up a little bit. Of course, it's been doctored up to give the famous Roy G. Biv. Here's another illustration in which you can see, in fact, the person just decided to omit indigo because they couldn't figure out what the devil indigo was as opposed to. And similarly, orange is also a kind of a dubious a, a dubious thing. And there you see Roy G. Biv himself. So I mean, I, this is a way of saying that this is just taught to every school child as a kind of fact of nature, was a crazy intervention of Newton's that was absolutely a musical thing, in which he said, OK, I'm just going to impose, I'm going to impose this on the color spectrum. But he knew that there was, he, he realized that there was a big problem because he he probably didn't discover the famous rings, which Hooke had probably seen before him, but which, as most great scientific discoverers, are not named for the first person to have found them, but for somebody else that you know, maybe made more of them later on. So when he came to describe the Newton's rings for, for the first time. It, so I want to show you a contrast that at first, when he describes this hypothesis of life, he says, well, violet all the way to red should be two to one because it should be. So, so for so, there would be all that variety in colors which within the compass of an eight octave is found in sounds. And he thought that somehow purple, violet, is like a recurrence or an octave higher of red, which he realized himself was not true. So that when he, here's his diagram of the Newton's rings. When he made his careful observations of the ratio of the rings, he realized it was not two to one, but it was greater than three to two or less than five to three as nine to 14. And it's, it's not that he didn't realize that had, that had a musical consequence. He says, well, there, in the optics, he says, it's very close to a major six, not an octave, but a major six, which is a much smaller interval, which is a kind of a strange thing to realize that our octave does not even, our eye does not see even an octave in color, only a major six, which is like from C to A on a piano or something like that. Whereas our ear hears many, many octaves from 32 cycles a second to depending how old you are and how, many, how much hearing loss you've got. Um, so the eye and the ear operate in a very different way. So Newton realized that what he had said could not possibly be right. And if he had thought one step further, he would have said, there must be a frequency. This must be a wave. And in fact, this was one of the great unfulfilled aspects of, 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 of his life, that he was aware of the wave theory. He had seen some evidence of interference in the work of Francesco Grimaldi. But to him, it was not sufficient evidence. The irony is that here he had sufficient evidence, but didn't even realize it. This was a case where had he taken the musical contradiction more strongly, he would have said, like, wait a minute, an octave and a major six are not the same. Therefore, my whole idea of imposing the seven notes within an octave is wrong. There must be something more going on. And in fact, the ratios that he get are very close to the ratios of the frequencies that we now know. He was, in fact, 
measuring the frequencies of light. So this is a case where music, I don't know, this shows you the dangers of music as well as its attractions. It led Newton to make a kind of musical ansatz, to impose a musical scale. It also led him to the verge of a realization in which he realized that something couldn't both be an octave and not an octave at the same time. At that point, whether he was distracted or it's hard to know because he went no further, um, it's hard to know why he didn't take the musical justification to say, well, wait a minute, my measurements really indicate a major sixth. Let me drop my earlier theory. Let's really find out what's going on. Mustn't there be, there must be some basis for these numbers. The only basis that could be is if these were not particles, as he originally thought, but waves that had a certain length number within them, and the ratio was just there. So Newton could have discovered the wave, had discovered the wave theory of light long before Thomas Young's decisive demonstrations about 1800, but didn't quite realize what he had in front of him. So here's a, a very different case of music. Did it abuse? Did it, did it mislead him? Probably not. Did he ignore it? He probably did. The last person I want to talk about is much closer to our time. Um, the word modern in my title may have led you to think that I don't, uh, that, I, that I think that modern is perhaps the 20th or the 21st century as opposed to 1600, which is the way I seem to be using that word. But Max Planck, I think, is an exemplary modern figure and it, of the greatest importance to the formation of modern science. And he forms an example of a third person. He was probably of the three physicists I'm talking about today, the one who was most interested in music. He was, as the Germans would say, ein Kulturträger, a culture bearer of the English word that I've been trying to think of how you say that in English. It's not very nice. A culture vulture is the closest word that we have, and it's not a nice word. It's, it it's, it's kind of derogatory. Not the German word Kulturträger, which indicates education, seriousness, all the qualities that the, the German 18th and 19th century and European in general thought most highly of. So here you see him at the age where he would have probably been just arriving at the Kavli Institute had, had he been lucky enough to be able to come to these, to these happy shores. He's about 20 years old at the time. Um, already by this point, he had formed what he writes in his autobiography as a kind of a life theme. The outside world is something independent from man, something absolute. And the quest for the laws which apply to this absolute appeared to me as the most sublime scientific pursuit in life. So this is one side of Planck's life. The other side was a musical side. He was a very, very fine pianist. Um, for quite a long time, he wasn't sure whether he should go into physics or into music. Uh, he wrote operettas. He conducted choruses. Uh, had a very, very acute sense of pitch, which will become important in the story that I'm going to tell about him. So he lived a kind of double life. And in that, he was very, very common. Um, uh, there were many, many physicists of his generation, really up until the present time. It's part of the, one of the questions I have. I remember playing piano and violin duets with my with my advisor, Sid Drell, who was a passionate violinist, still is a passionate violinist, I hope. Um, and there were many, many people, um, physicists of those generations at Los, at Los Alamos. There are all kinds of recollections of Otto Frisch playing the piano and Heisenberg playing a Beethoven sonata to people and remarking that even if someone or other would have discovered uh, the uncertainty principle, but nobody could have written of Beethoven's last sonata that, that represented a kind. I mean, the, the absorption, the uh, near obsession of th those people with music was very, very great. And so uh, the story I'm going to tell is not merely a story about a particular or peculiar individual, but about many, many young Germans. For one thing, um, the ideal of education for, for, for Germans, for Europeans in, uh, in general, but for Germans with a special intensity, was a kind of degree of culture in which music formed the absolute apex. Knowledge of love of music, playing a musical instrument, um, worshiping at the shrines of music was uh, not only obligatory as a kind of um, external, in, uh, external expectation of cultured people, but it was something that these people really lived out with a passion. 
in a similar way to they, they all memorized Goethe, it seems, and were quoting parts of Goethe to each other. And this formed a kind of private language. It formed the kind of bond that, that drew them together. So here you see a sketch of, of, of Planck's life that led him um, first to, to, to his university studies in Munich, and then he goes to Berlin to work with Hermann von Helmholtz, who is another uh, figure uh, that's of the greatest importance in the history of physics as well as of physiology. Um, he's going to come back into our story in just a moment. And then I've sketched on for you here um, a couple of the later stages that I'm going to talk about. But let me pause for a moment to talk about Helmholtz. Helmholtz, who was an army surgeon who really put the first law of thermodynamics, as we call it now, on the map, really wanted to be a physicist, but his family couldn't afford it. He had to go into the army. He became a surgeon somehow. In the course of his work on surgery, he you know, advanced the energy principle and also discovered several of the, of the instruments. That he's holding his most famous one, the ophthalmoscope, which has shown in every one of our eyes at some visit to a doctor's office. He somehow solved the optical problem, the, you know, the, the instrumental problem of illuminating the back of the eye. But you'll see also, and you'll see other instruments there, some of them optical, some acoustical, because Helmholtz has the distinction not only of having written the great treatise on physiological optics, which stands to this day as being a kind of a monument of understanding the operation of the eye and the visual system in a, in a new way, but he also did the same thing for, uh, for sound. So if we look more closely at the things on his desk, you see the ophthalmoscope, but there's also a resonator, a little a glass or metal sphere that he would use to pick up the overtones and to actually take the overtones of some kind of a sound and bring them forward. And there's numbers of other instruments like, like that there. So when Planck goes to, visit, goes to study with Helmholtz, just at the age of the portrait that you saw him at the age of 20, um, he went to a kindred spirit. We know that he went to Helmholtz's. The professors in those days were having musical evenings all the time. When there were scientific meetings, there was always singing. Can you imagine that? Felix Mendelssohn wrote a cantata specifically for a meeting of, of German scientists because it was inconceivable that you'd have a scientific meeting in which people didn't get together after dinner and sing. So Helmholtz, uh, in his, on the sensations of tone, as a basis for the theory of music, gave another big, huge volume which did for acoustics, hearing, and the physiology of hearing, what his book on the physiology of optics had done for vision. It gave a magisterial overview that drew together everything from wave theory, Fourier analysis, musical notation, ethnomusicology. Um, it was really, an, it remains a kind of an astonishing work. And one of, the, one of the things that happened in the course of that is that Helmholtz became interested in the problem of tuning, which you remember I brought up at the very beginning. There's a fundamental difficulty um, with tuning that even God himself seems not to be able to solve. That is, that you can't span an octave with seven or six tones, that there's a leftover, there's an anomaly that keeps coming back, and the different tunings or scales will shuffle in different ways. Um, so that the, the Helmholtz realized it became one of his, his themes became was that there sh was a natural form of tuning, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, which is far superior to the equal temperament that's applied, or was already applied in his time, to pianos. And, and so he, he, he concludes in his sensations of tone, the natural intervals are really natural for uncorrupted years, that moreover the deviations of tempered intonation are really perceptible and unpleasant to uncorrupted ears. And singing by natural intervals is much easier than singing in tempered intonation. And this became a kind of obsession for him. And here is what he's talking about. You see the different, the Pythagorean on the left-hand column, the simple ratios two to one, three to two, are shared between the, temp the Pythagorean, what was called just, or Helmholtz and Planck will use the word natural, the highly charged word natural to describe what modern people will call just intonation. Those, were the those are the primordial intervals that Pythagoras mythically heard in the blacksmith shop. If Pythagoras wanted to go on and construct what we would call major and minor thirds, he gets intervals that are much more complicated looking, 81 to 64, 32 by 27, 
by the Renaissance, people had gone, grown so fond of those intervals that they said, like, well, we would like to make them a little easier to play and sing. So they found approximations, five to four, six to five, which were much closer. The trouble was that then you couldn't get a piano keyboard because you would, sometimes you'd have to split the keys or use other devices because you couldn't fit or you could only play in one key at a time. You couldn't switch keys. The modern solution that came about in the later Renaissance was that there should be an equal temperament. What this meant was that rather than making certain intervals more, because if you were to go beyond the major third, the intervals would become very, very complicated. So the idea of the equal temperament was that every smallest distance from a white key to the nearest black key would be the 12th root of two. So that every, the, the, the evil of the world would be spread out uniformly everywhere, as opposed to lumping up in certain places. So this, was the, this is the equal tempered solution which that innocent piano and the clavinova over there uh, bear within them, and which you just heard Helmholtz inveighing against. Uh, this remains a kind of obsession even to the present day. And, and even though it, it, in Helmholtz's time, he had he tried to convince great musicians. He brought Johannes Brahms and Josef Joachim, the most famous musicians of his time, to his home. Helmholtz had a very elaborate harmonium, which more in just a moment, in which he played them the true natural intervals and contrasted them with the equal tempered intervals. And it, this is a, a rant from the YouTube, which will give you the modern flavor of it. This is the sound and visual image of a pure harmonic third, an A and a C sharp. This is the tempered version, as played by a modern piano or guitar, clearly out of tune. This is the pure harmonic fifth, an A, and an E. And the tempered version of a fifth, again, out of tune. When we put these mistuned tempered intervals together in a major chord, you can hear the rough and restless quality that Helmholtz referred to. The pure chord rings true every interval in perfect harmonic balance. So this is, this is the obsession that, that, that Helmholtz had, and that you can hear, for instance, here's a piece, uh, another piece of Orlando de Lasso, which you can hear a bit. Here's a, a live performance by you know, the Hilliard Ensemble, who are singing. It's not clear what they're singing in, because it's, they're influenced clearly by the equal temperament of the piano. But they're also, and Helmholtz's theory was that if you got a bunch of singers together, that they would gravitate towards the natural and away from the artificial equal. And so here's a bit of them singing in just in. is a version sung by human voices but corrected with a tuning software, which are now very widely used, in which you can sing quite out of tune. And the, this, this can put you in absolute perfect just intonation. something of this kind of uh, kind of shocking kind of uh, I mean even though those the differences between the intervals are slight but when you put them together in that way you start to hear if it's possible as it is sometimes you, you know and now, even though at the time Brahms thought that Helmholtz was a, a big amateur, is what he wrote in his letters, now people that perform early music, you know, written in that period, try to go back to these early temperaments, figuring that that's what the way they were meant to be heard. So at any rate, 
after this year that he spent with helmholtz planck eventually made it to the university of berlin where he's appointed full professor of physics and arrived in one ninety three this shows you something of way things were back then was the first thing that said well professor planck we have this harmonium here that helmholtz ordered why don't you spend the next few years working with our harmonium right that's not probably the thing that that would have happened had he arrived at most normal american departments but um, uh, Planck wrote a paper which doesn't appear in his collected physics works, Natural Tuning and Modern Vocal Music, in which he became very interested in Helmholtz's claim. Was it really true or not that cigarettes would gravitate towards natural tuning, which is not equal, or towards equal, which is what they'd heard all their lives? Um, and in fact, what he then did was that he started to use this, this is the harmonium, the famous harmonium, the one that Planck himself used, for some reason, didn't survive the First and Second World Wars, but uh, I can't tell why. But at any rate, here's one in the Deutsches Museum. And you can see it's quite a intimidating looking uh, thing. And here's its keyboard. This harmonium can divide the octave into 104 steps. And so although it doesn't produce a continuum of sounds, you can produce a lot of intervals. You could play in any, in any number of, in, of, of, uh, of scales that you want. And here's Planck's diagram. Planck wrote a paper about this harmonium because he was so interested. And here's how he shows. And he remarks that it was possible to play it with after a little practice, um, showing how skilled he was. And somehow he felt that he describes the, this, this episode with the harmonium, he describes it some detail in his autobiography. He was clearly very happy doing it and quite fascinated. But he decided that it was, he, he wanted to really investigate uh, Helmholtz's claim. And this is kind of interesting because Planck was the first, really one of the first theoretical physicists as such. Up until his time, physicists were expected to be experimenters, as Helmholtz was. Ex he designed equipment, he performed experiments. There was no professor of theoretical physics. I think Max Planck was the first one in the University of Berlin. And so we're about to look at his one and only experiment. Well, it's a kind of peculiar experiment because it's an experiment with choruses. As I mentioned, he had been conducting choruses all his life. So he decided, I know, I'm going to construct a piece which if people sung it, sang it according to always looking for the natural, just intonation, then what would happen would be that because he would write it sort of modulating around in such a way that it, the pitch would drop by a half step. So for instance, if I play this for you, with this is a synthesized version in which at every chord, when the chord changes, the voices adaptively move so that they're singing just intervals. And here's how it sounds. <laughs> go back to the beginning and play it again for you, just the beginning. The, you see, it begins and ends with the same chord, but it had sunk down a half step so that the beginning of it and the end were different. Now, here's an actual human voices at the premiere of this piece at Harvard last year. Mm -hmm. no. 
and this was this is done sort of impromptu by a group which christened itself the Planktones um, <laughs> of, of scientists that were present. So this happened to to Planck also. He realized that that even though, as his teacher had taught him, um, the natural somehow should win out over the merely cultural, it didn't work. The fact that these singers had been listening to pianos all their life meant more to them than the voice of nature. But, 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 but Planck went a little further than that. He was a good scientist, uh, even a good experimenter. He said, like, wait a minute, if there's supposed to be some kind of an effect, what if I reverse the apparatus and see if I can make the effect move the opposite way? So he wrote his second composition, which should go up a half step, okay? And here's, here's how it goes the synthesized version. <laughs> Compare it with the beginning. Again. So it rose up. Okay, so now we have our human subjects. So the, again, um, habit, custom wins out over nature. This was the first surprising thing that Planck ever discovered. I mean, he'd been working on thermodynamics. He had been, you know, he was, the person didn't get to be full professor in Berlin for nothing. But this is the first moment where he discovered something that was quite the opposite of anything that he had been prepared to discover before. And that also reflected on breaking things up into equal and unequal parts. Well, he was about to carry on with this, and but then the following year is the so-called, what he called himself, the black year of German physics, 1894. Helmholtz, Kunt, and Hertz all died in the same year, leaving Planck as the only tenured member of his department. And he had, you know, perforce to sort of look at to things other than the harmonium. Uh, and so that and he, it's at this point he goes back to black body radiation. And his, in his autobiography, he goes immediately from his account of the harmonium to his account of black body radiation. Black body radiation what has had a more kind of practical pressure. The German lighting industry, and I guess the Siemens light bulbs in particular, wanted to understand the radiation laws uh, that were that were under underlying the their products. Um, and the the Reich Technische Anstalt, the famous institute that, that Helmholtz had begun, which was designed to be a kind of center of applied as well as of pure science, was ideally situated to illuminate this. And so in this very practical context, 
Um, the observations were made by, by, by Planck's colleagues, uh, Luma and Pringsheim, and had made the first careful measurements of the black body radiation, black body spectrum, which, as you all know, led Planck then to put forward his uh, famous hypothesis of the quantum. So, um, the interesting thing about this is that, that when he explains, in the papers in which he explains his reasoning for introducing his his formula, he uses oscillators and resonators. And in fact, of course, it's well known that Hertz himself, his colleague, had used oscillators, so that the use of resonators and oscillators was, was very important. And for instance, in this video, we can see a, a Hertzian oscillator. And you can see that it's producing both a, a spark, the very spark and a sound. That is to say, it's both an oscillator in the electrical, mechanical, and optical senses all at once, okay? And here's, just to remind you, one of the resonators of Helmholtz, and he also uses the word resonator to describe harmonium reads. So Planck is using, the, when he talks about resonators rather than oscillators, he is using the exact same term that Helmholtz had used to describe the instrument on which he had just been working for a year uh, before he turned to the work that led him to the to this, um, to this formula. So he doesn't, um, I mean, I guess I want to make a, Planck doesn't comment upon this. He doesn't say anything like, nor am I claiming, like, and therefore, because of my work on the harmonium, I invented the quantum, but I'm just noticing that, he's, that the, the, the work before one immediately precedes the other, and furthermore, there are certain, there's a certain, there are certain points of similarity which are kind of interesting. So when Planck himself uh, try to understand what he had done. Of course, he introduced these famous natural units that you see in front of him. Uh, they're not in, uh, phrased in the way in which we're most, uh, that we're most used to seeing them, but these are the units. Um, when Planck took his son Erwin aside in 1900 and went, you know, went on a little canoeing trip with him, he said, I've, when he said, I've discovered something that is as important as the work of, of Newton, this is what he really meant, that he had discovered he had discovered something absolute that was true. You remember that was his theme ever since he was a young person, that he was searching for something absolute. Um, and just w w this is the phrase that he ends the, the, the passage that I showed you on the other slide. These units necessarily maintain their meaning for all times and for all cultures, even extraterrestrial and non-human ones, and could therefore be designated as natural units. And these natural units, of course, are, are, are very, very famous to us. There's a Planck time, but it's not so well noticed, noted that there's, of course, a Planck frequency also. That is to say, an inverse time that can be formed from this. And that frequency, in fact, if you assume this is, uh, if, you, if you play what, I, I, I can't play it to you because it's 135 octaves above middle C, which is, even above the hearing of the youngest people in the room, even or any animals that might be present, but just for your just for your amusement, it corresponds to 135 above, uh, 135 octaves above that note. Which I'm going to try to stop. There it goes. So that, oops. So that. Essentially, what, what this shows is that any energy through Planck's por formula can be turned into a frequency, and not just a frequency arbitrarily, but a frequency that can be related to an absolute frequency that has the status among frequencies that Pl the Planck mass has among masses or energies. So that it's, it's kind of amusing to think that, in fact, the meaning of Planck's expression is a kind of tuning of the world, and it's an equal tuning because one does know that the, the, the spacing, these, the, the, quant, the spacing between quanta is an equal spacing. So it's, it's an irony. I don't know, was it lost on Planck? Did he realize it? He is a very smart person. I, I assume that he can think this thought if we can, that in essence, he had resolved the problem that had bedeviled him during the the, the uh, harmonium episode, that is to say the conflict between un unequal temperament, unequal division of energy units and equal, uh, and equal division and uh, uh, similarly at the same time between conventional uh, and natural. His work 
with the quantum actually reconciled it because he had found something that was universal and natural, but also equal. So that he was able in this work to do something that had eluded him in the realm of music. Um, I don't know. As I say, this is not something that Planck himself points out, but that it seems to me to be sufficiently obvious that I wonder if the irony and the beauty of it might not have been uh, clear to him too. So I don't know. These three episodes, I put back this quote from Einstein in front of us in, in conclusion, but as a way also of asking us, these, this takes us to the almost to the threshold of the present day. It's not clear whether the story of music and science and physics in particular, which has gone on now for thousands of years, whether it's over or whether or now it has new phases that we don't yet know that are about to begin. Thank you. So questions? Uh, Peter would answer a few questions. Please. Yeah, I have one concerning those, those font tunes are very, very interesting. I, I was also surprised that the singers, that the singers mm -hmm. uh, didn't, didn't go up or down. And you, you um, it's plausible that they're used, they're used to the, the equal temperament and that's what did it. But isn't there also sort of an ambiguity if you're in one of those measures? Are you playing a dominant mm -hmm. of another note or mm -hmm. a subdominant of the note after that? And it seems that the context of what's been happening and what's mm -hmm. been happening in the music would dictate whether the group actually evolves the same to the end or up or down. I, I think the Planck tried to figure that out by always holding one note. If you look at the music, oh, yeah. he's all constructed in such a way that like from measure one to two, that G in the, the, the alto sings a G that holds on, so does the tenor actually, and by that he means, okay, one pitch is going to remain fixed, then the others are going to adjust around it. Do they adjust according to the natural way, singing natural intervals, or do they adjust according to the piano way, in which, you know, the piano doesn't have to adjust, it's just fixed, it's mechanized in that sense, the pitches come out, you don't have to find them, whereas a singer, I mean, anybody that's sung in an a cappella group knows that they have to find the pitches. They also know that, at least nowadays, their choral director will yell at them if their pitch sinks and if they get, get, get off from the piano. And of course, everybody's known that phenomenon happening. There's a kind of, of, kind of law of gravity that people's pitch usually tends to sink, sink not to rise. So I think he rather cleverly, he doesn't call these compositions, but, but he presents them. They are both compositions and experiments, which is, I think, a, a kind of unique and, and so they interesting have, they thing. Have yeah. They have a direction. They have a direction. And once the, 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 each note forms the kind of fixed point around which the others have to form, and then he builds it up in such a way, and he learned how to do this from, the harmo from his harmonium, in which you can, you can, in fact, I didn't show this particular side, but here he, you can see how he did it. Basically, he starts at one, he started in one corner of the harmonium and works himself up five levels. Those five commas add up to about a semitone. This is how, this is, he, he must have figured this out on the harmonium first. And then he said, aha, I'll have people do it and find out what they really do. Uh, I should also mention that uh, Peter uh, said that he would be very happy to talk to anyone uh, in more detail. Yeah. To the talk yeah. Later. So, other questions, please. Yeah, question over here. Okay. Um, my question is more related to your remarkable career than about the pop, because I'm a I'm finishing physics PhD student who is uh -huh. like the piano here at UCMP. <laughs> Sure, I'd be delighted to. I'm, I'm, I'm flattered by, by, your, by your question. But I think that it's interesting to think that, especially someone like Planck gives an example of someone who's very serious, who loved music, but and ultimately decided to pursue physics and to keep the, for whom the interest in music was very deep and that can be pursued quite seriously. So I think I, I'm, 
Maybe this is the many world. Uh, this is better than the many worlds interpretation. You can live several lives at once. There's no reduction of the wave. I mean, I suppose there are reductions on, of the wave packet on paydays or maybe marriages or other kind of life events where some, something has to be decided. But for much of our lives, many parallel streams are running together and often quite independently. And I think that that often there's a great deal of happiness to be found in that. I think that. Uh, one thing I can remember people saying as I grew up, you must decide, you must do one or the other. And I knew that they were right. They probably were right. It's entirely my failure that I, I didn't or couldn't follow their advice, but I just couldn't do it. And so as a result, um, yeah, I might have found myself writing this book. But I don't think I could have written the book had I not lived both lives at once. So, I mean, I'm encouraging to live parallel lives. And the way I often think about it is that our ancestors were amphibians, as you know. That is to say, they, these were the, our ancestors were the fish that had legs and, and, and lungs and were probably laughed at by the other fish that have thought it was really <laughs> ridiculous to have things like that. No proper fish would have these stumpy things. And breathing air was really not, you know. Our ancestors survived because they could live in several worlds at once, not easily. I'm sure it was very difficult for our ancestors to crawl out gasping from the, the welcoming sea onto the beach. And similarly, I think in our lives, it's not easy to live several lives at once. But sometimes it not only has to be done, but it leads to possibilities of insight. I mean, I think part of the story of Planck is that if one's too narrowly focused, one may not see the larger picture that, that music was a way also in which people spread their wings uh, and they had a kind of a broader view. And I think it actually was not merely, merely, if the word merely can be used, merely helped them to be better human beings, although let's hope that that's enough. But it also at certain points affected their science in a way that gave them views of possibilities and interest in things like the theory of vibrations, for instance, which is so important in the development of field theory. And one could go on and on and on about that in particular, which ultimately goes back to music itself, which helped them. Well, it's a famous, uh, a famous speculation, and one that, of course, you know, I'll talk about a little bit. But I've, it's hard to find very hard evidence. And in my book, I tried to stay with things like this, where there was really something that one could see that was not just, you know, a piece of evidence like Planck's work. We know that Galileo's father, Vincenzo, was a lutenist and composer, a very important figure in the history of music, who tried out Pythagoras's experiments and realized that most of them were just fake couldn't have happened, uh, which was very disturbing and interesting to him and the people at the time. Like, what did it mean to have an experiment, a so-called experiment that was the origin of all experiments that was a faked experiment? That was very, and remains a very disturbing thing. It also seems clear that, that Galileo was, he was aware of these things. And Stillman Drake speculated that Galileo watched his father's experiments, which involved weights dangling from the ends of strings, and the weights would have swung back and forth. And he could have discovered the pendulum law right then and there. And Stillman Drake speculates that it happened there, watching his father's experiments, rather than, in, as the famous story has it, in the, watching the lamps in the cathedral or something like that. But there's no evidence. It's hard to say. And Galileo himself doesn't say about his father, you know, oh, he, he meant everything to me, or like, oh, you know, he was such a pain, you know, and I, I did everything I could to get away from him. We really don't know what he thought. Um, Galileo does write quite beautifully about music himself in the dialogue of the two new sciences, but his example are the reverse of the ones that I talked about in my book and in this talk. That is to say, it's a more of a case in which his view of science influenced music rather than music influencing science. So, I mean, the one thing that I do uh, wonder about in the book is that uh, Galileo's father is one of the first Italians to refer positively to the Copernican theory. And that's very striking. Copernicus's book was not widely circulated in Italy compared to its circulation in the German-speaking lands. It's very surprising that Galileo's father had it. 
but his music teacher, with whom he had a famous feud, Zarlino, also had a copy of Copernicus's book. And uh, Galileo's father, at a certain point, uses a musical argument that I discussed in my book to say, yeah, the Copernican theory is much better. See, look at the symmetry here around the sun. And he uses a kind of musical, a musical uh, demonstration of that. So I speculate that either Galileo heard about it from his father and said, like, this, this Copernican thing is pretty cool, or Galileo Sr. heard about it from Galileo Jr. He said, like, oh, you know, Dad, would you stop with that tall mag stuff? Look, there's this book. Think about it this way. I don't know which way it went. I suspect that I went from the father to the son, but there's really no evidence. Galileo's early notebooks are very Ptolemaic, but he could have been towing the line, you know, knowing he had to pass an exam and he had to say the right things, uh, you know, in praise of the geocentric. It's hard to know. When Galileo finally writes to Kepler in 1597 saying that for many years he had been convinced of, of the Copernican idea, he doesn't say how many years, so it's impossible. So, that's the, that's the unknown aspect. So that Stillman Dakes, Greg's claim that music was the mother of modern science, I, you know, I'm taking with a grain of salt and saying like, well, that's not exactly true. They're, they're, but their relationship is complicated and I think is intense. There is a relationship, but it's more nuanced than that, I think. Um, one aspect of your book that you did not mention in your lecture, actually, is the relationship between music and famous mathematicians like Euler and yes. so on. That's perhaps even more than Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and more Euler than spent all of his spare time on music, according to his son-in-law and amanuensis. And his first book was on music. Uh, even before he started doing, and in the book I argue, that the work on number theory was directly stimulated by the kind of quasi-number theoretical work that he does on, on music, also early developments in topology, but I didn't have time to talk about it, talk about it here. Actually, I haven't. Um, and there probably lots could be done on that. Galileo himself was quite a skilled uh, painter and artist. They're wonderful. Wonder, I, I, many people in the room have seen his beautiful drawings of the phases of the moon and the mountains of the moon. And he, there's famous arguments. For instance, there's a famous argument by Ervin Pranofsky that trying to explain why Galileo hated ellipses, because it was well known. He doesn't, he's not so polite to say to Kepler directly in one of his letters, like, you know, I hate your ellipses, but he never, he never used them. And Panofsky, for instance, speculates, it's also known that Galileo hated manneristic arc, which loved ovals and ellipses. And so Panofsky in this article says like, okay, this is the reason why Galileo hated ellipses is because his artistic preferences were such that ellipses were ugly to him and he preferred circles. The trouble is that, I mean, I was trying to find an argument that would be stronger than that because that, it seems to me that developments in science are not determined by a single thing, that they're very complexly determined by events within science, but also as historians are increasingly showing us, by currents of thought that happen outside the strictest confines of the internal discourse of, of, of a discipline. So it's hard to know. Um, I myself haven't, because music means so much to me, I guess I decided I would stick with music. The other reason is a really profound and historical. It, when the Greeks set up, when Plato set up liberal education, there were no graphic arts there. There was no painting or sculpture. It was music, astronomy, geometry. I mean, so there's a historical, a historically inscribed fact that ever since now for thousands of years, music has been considered to be somehow involved with mathematics and science in ways that no other art is. And that goes back to the separation that music was a liberal art, but but painting, sculpture were fine arts. They were not, they didn't have this deep and long-term relationship with mathematics, which set music apart. Um, but it seems to me, I mean, I think there is work that, I, there are people that have written things like that that I've seen, but I, I don't know how to assess it. And I think it seems important that that we think tend to think of the arts as being on a kind of par, you know. Um, that that's a very recent view, really, post 18th century, o over the span of thousands of years. Uh, I don't think it just hasn't been true. Uh, are there further urgent questions? Otherwise, we uh, can continue uh, privately. So let's thank the speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.